This episode of Out of the Trenches is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. And Out of the Trenches is where I, Indy Nidell, sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. Uh, Neo Torchwick writes, Hey Indy, during the First World War, how did naval tactics evolve? Did they evolve as massively as tactics on the ground, or due to the rather static nature of naval warfare, did new tactics for naval warfare just not evolve to the same extent? And did dreadnoughts have a profound effect on how naval forces engaged each other, like how the machine gun did to the infantry? Love your show. You inspire me to research global history on my own, so thank you for giving me the inspiration to follow my dreams. Well, that was very nice. Well, I'm, I'm honored I could be an inspiration. Uh, oh, anyhow, uh, the traditional tactics of naval warfare since the turn of the 20th century, right, didn't drastically change during the war. Um, other than the Battle of Jutland in 1916 and some comparatively minor engagements in the Baltics, the Black Sea, and the Adriatic Sea. There were no decisive clashes of two mighty fleets that could have led to a, an evaluation of new doctrines and tactics. Instead, the real decisive naval power was the supply and merchant ships, right? Because many nations could not have stayed in the war had they not been supplied by sea. There, it became a race between offensive and defensive weapons. The U-boats and raiders versus the uh, convoys and countermeasures like depth charges. Uh, you could even argue that the Great War was the beginning of the end for the traditional dominance of big naval ships like dreadnoughts or other heavy class battleships. More cost-effective, small and cheap torpedo boats alongside uh, mine layers and aircraft bombers began threatening the years of investment in money and resources of the big naval fleets. Um, they were still relevant though, but only in concert with other elements, like we see in the amphibious landings of, say, Gallipoli or in the Gulf of Riga. Uh, also, uh, aircraft began stealing their spotlight, which we see in the rise of hydroplanes and the first aircraft carriers that began emerging at the end of the war. Uh, Callum says, Hi Indy and the Great War team. Uh, thanks for all your ongoing work. Love the show. What were conditions for the highest ranked officers which were taken prisoner? Thinking of Major General Charles Townsend after the surrender at Kut al Amara. Thanks again. Okay. <clears throat> While, his, while Townsend's soldiers suffered horrendously on the death march from their defeat at Kut el Amara in 1916, British Major General Charles Townsend, on the other hand, enjoyed his stay in Constantinople in luxury and freedom. He was considered more of an honored guest of Enver Pasha than a common prisoner. Uh, Townsend was allowed to freely move through the city, dine with uh, Enver's inner circle in the evening, and even talk to the press. That, of course, was exactly what Enver Pasha wanted Townsend to do, to speak to the press and create a positive image of the Ottoman Empire at home. Uh, and Townsend did become a vocal supporter of the Turkish cause after the war ended and openly criticized the Allied policy and the peace treaty of Sevres. Uh, he was somehow surprised that he was shunned by his peers at home. Although this was kind of an exaggerated occurrence during the war, um, most higher officers were treated quite well by their captors. The gentleman's code of the officer class existed throughout the war, and the higher your rank, the more privileges and liberty you could enjoy in your captivity. High officers usually had their own prisons, okay, or gentleman camps, right, where they employed their own staff and had their own necessities. Officers of all nations treated each other more or less as equals in the understanding that they all belonged to an upper class with the same morals, the same standards, the same social background. Uh, their code of honor allowed them to live by their word alone. If they promised they would not attempt to escape, well, they most likely didn't do it out of respect. Hey, Indy. Hey, Flo. How did they Wait, Flo, we're shooting. Okay, but very quick question. How did the Ottoman troops end up in Romania, actually? Uh, okay, yeah, I can answer that. Okay. Okay, um... Well, uh, Flo, um, the Brusilov Offensive had caused such high casualties 
uh, to the Austro-Hungarian army. And now that offensive happened in the summer of 1916. That it pretty much exhausted the reserves of that whole sector. German high command sought to prevent a collapse, but it had its own hand full on the Western Front. So they went to Enver Pasha for help. Um, and this created the Turkische Abteilung, the Turkish detachment. The Ottoman 15th Corps, consisting of the 20th Infantry Division and Mustafa Kemal's battle-hardened 19th Infantry Division, would fight on the Romanian front, many of them as shock troops. Two other corps were formed and were sent to the Macedonian front. Assigned to Lieutenant General Graf von Botma of the Sudarme, they were positioned alongside German divisions at the Zlota Lipa River. Fighting began in early September 1916 as superior Russian forces attacked all over the front lines. Heavy fighting ensued with the Turkish repulsing repeated assaults of the Russian infantry and even poison gas. But uh, constant pressure broke the Austrians in the south, while the Germans lacked the strength to counterattack. The whole front had to retreat and the line was shortened. Only after the Russian offensive had run out of steam at the end of September could combined German-Turkish attacks retake much of the lost ground. Both nations' armies actually worked very well together on that front. Some Turkish troops were even formed into stormtroop battalions and trained with flamethrowers. That is where they pretty much stayed until August 1917, as that front quieted down and then they were needed in their home country. Uh, Hunter McKenzie writes, Howdy from a fellow Houstonian, Indy. All right. I actually live right next to St. John's. Uh, St. John's, to anybody who doesn't know, St. John's was the school I went to growing up in Houston, although I did not live next to St. John's. I lived pretty far away. Anyhow, uh, you may have already said something about this, but why were the Ottomans having such a difficult time holding back the British in Mesopotamia and Sinai and the Russians in the ca Caucasus now that Gallipoli had ended and most of the Turkish manpower could be diverted on these fronts. Was it just poor leadership and tactics or something else? Can't tell you how much I love the show. Y'all are great. Well, y'all are probably great too. All right. Uh, in comparison to most other warring nations, the state of the infrastructure and supply system of the Ottoman army was extremely poor, to put it mildly. Uh, that and the lack of cohesion and even conviction in many parts of the army undermined its capability to fight modern war against nations that were better prepared and better equipped. And those problems were, they were obvious right from the start. In the disastrous winter offensive in the Caucasus in December of 1914 and January 1915, of the 100,000 man strong 3rd Army, for example, only a fifth came back to its starting positions because of abysmal leadership and supply issues that well, condemned the men to their deaths in the freezing mountains. 20,000 new recruits were sent to reinforce the destroyed army. Of those 20,000, only a fragment reached the front, with 12,000 deserters roaming the landscape. As the victorious Russian army captured the fortress city Erzurum, their booty, what they took, ready, consisted of 200 outdated guns and empty storage space. Um, this engagement in the Caucasus is a prime example of what hindered the Ottoman war effort. The problem was not the common soldier. I mean, these guys were generally as courageous and as good as any other soldier of the war, but the poor, poor state of the military apparatus itself. The Dardanelles were, by comparison, a prime example of what the Ottoman army could really do with competent leaders, modern equipment, short supply routes, and patriotically motivated men. And that victory gave the Ottomans the breath to rebuild their army and create new reserves, but it did not solve their problems. It, it took 35 days to transport a grenade from Constantinople to Ottoman Armenia country, right? That's 35 days. The empire severely lacked any allocated workshops and warehouses. Uh, trucks and planes had to be brought in by the central powers, the other central powers. Many supplies were simply sold or stolen on the way to the front. So the armies were constantly undersupplied. The few machines available could not be maintained. Artillery pieces could not be repaired. Wounded soldiers could not receive medical attention. This is why once the Ottoman army was defeated in the field, it was hard to get them back into the fight. But we will definitely talk about this in future once we have found, I guess, the right way to tackle it. 
So, as I said in the beginning, this episode of Out of the Trenches is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a fantastic online video learning service. They feature over 7,000 different courses with top professors from all over the world that cover a variety of topics. And starting at $14.99 a month, you can get unlimited access to all of these courses and watch them all. Oh, and funny, we were just talking, and speaking of Russia and the Caucasus and all, um, they have a really cool course that they call the History of Russia. And the great thing about this History of Russia, and this is why we all liked it, and well, you guys probably would too, the great thing is that they spend a lot of time on Russia's history in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, if you want a really detailed look at the development of Russia up to the revolution of 1917, and a detailed look at the aftermath, like the Russian Civil War, you should totally check out this course by Professor Mark Steinberg. Uh, he does a really great job explaining the social and cultural changes and how the lives of ordinary Russians changed over the decades. So head over to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash thegreatwar or click the link in the video description and you can start a one month free trial and check out the history of Russia or any and all of the 7,000 video courses they have to offer. And by doing so, you will be supporting me and this show. Do not forget to subscribe and we will see you next time.